Eric, welcome to the Virtual CMO Podcast. Very glad you could join us today. Thanks. Glad to be here. I love our topic today because we're going to really talk about the customer and being obsessed and how do you know if you're an obsessed business about your customer. And, you know, I don't want to lead things off here by being overly pessimistic, but I think as a consumer, it's pretty much assumed that most businesses are not going to be very customer obsessed, that they're not going to focus too much on me as a customer. What do you think is the state of the customer today with most businesses? You know, maybe like a lot of things, it's a standard distribution of excellent to average to poor. So maybe there's 3% in that first standard deviation and 13% that are getting a B plus or better. But I think the society is organized to make money. You know, if you're mm -hmm. a public company, you're supposed to be making profits. You're supposed to be making the stock go up. So you get focused on money and maybe you forget that you the, the place where the money comes from is the customer. So yeah. if you think of, if you want to think about money and you want to be you know profitable and successful, I think you can't go wrong being customer obsessed. Everything about the customer is helpful for your business. Everything you do, whether you're you know any kind of service provider, but particularly if you're in a subscription business where people are staying with you month to month or quarter to quarter, you have to renew. It's like being an employee that's on a shorter contract, right? If you if you if your contract as an employee got renewed every month you would really be focused on what you got to do this month to get to the next month. But yeah. I think people lose sight of that. And I heard this term customer obsessed from Forrester mm. and it helps because I work in Silicon Valley, you know, our agency is a product and service company. And when we go to talk to the analysts, when we do briefings and inquiries, they say, well, you know, prove to us that you're customer obsessed, like, you know, or, you know, and they're helping us organize the, the communication and the presentation lead with the customer, lead with the customer's problems. It's it's more fun. Um, there's always a time and a place to talk product or solution, but it's usually not the beginning. It's usually sort of the middle of that process. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, being from Silicon Valley, you certainly are in the hub of technology. And I think a lot of technologists are engineers at heart, right? They are looking at things from a product standpoint, not necessarily from a customer standpoint. Give you a great example. I just got a message the other day from a provider. Uh, I had a bill that I needed to pay. So they sent me a text reminder. I go to their website and they say, well, please enter your bill number. Well, how the heck do I know what my bill number yeah, is? I'm responding to a text yeah. message. You right. know, but that's the way their system is probably indexed to know what to do. But it's completely outside the realm of what I, as a customer, have available at my fingertips. Sure. And, and not only that, maybe they've gone backwards here. At first, you might have been happy to get a reminder that this bill's due and it's a good time to pay it. And now you feel like you got given homework, which is one of the things yes. I like to say. Don't give your boss homework and don't give your customers homework. Make things easy, right? You pack it where my job as a marketer is to be packaging things so that they're ultra consumable and we're maximizing the, the, the benefit and the esteem and the value that that customer perceives. Same with your boss. You don't give your boss a bunch of half-baked stuff. I mean, that never works out. Right. Your boss wants things polished and finished, right? Yes. Well, and there's, I, I love this idea of homework because I think that that's so true. I see this particularly in service interactions where it seems like the first response to a service interaction is to ask the customer to do something more. It's not bad enough that they're reaching out for a problem. It's that now that you're asking them to do something more to sort of prove that they have a problem instead of accepting it at face value. It's or very fill out a big form that should be auto filled out because once you know my address, because I'm a customer, you, you, yes. I shouldn't have to fill out 10 more fields. Yes. How, about, how about when you are really upset as a customer and you submit something to get help and the, the email that comes back says no reply at, yes. at, uh, at, at your provider. And it says, Nobody is monitoring this. Nobody will reply to this email. I'm like, hmm. Yes. I'm sure, that's. I'm not sure I wanted to know that about you. I, I know. That's exactly right. I've noticed that as well. I think a great example uh, is I called into a doctor's office recently. And, you know, you get the automated voice response system and it goes through the choices, right? You know, press number one if you're another physician. Press number two if you're a lab calling. Press number three if you're not. You, know, you go through all the numbers and like number nine, number if you're a patient, Press you're number patient, if you're the people right. who pay our bills. Right. Shouldn't that be number one? It I was think like so. no. And it just shows sort of the mentality, the thinking of an organization like that. It's like patients are our last priority, which is yeah. it's so sad. 
Yeah, it's not good. We wouldn't put them in the top standard deviation of uh, providers, but I'm sure there's people who are doing it right in medical care. You know, I'm sure there's people that have figured out in dent dentistry or uh, plastic surgery or people who are getting regular, uh, you know, skin treatments and stuff. They probably figured out better ways to do that to, to get the maximum amount of uh, recurring uh, visits from their customers. All right. Competition is a beautiful thing, right? If you're yeah. in an optional service, yeah, you have to really work for it a little bit more. But, yeah. you know, this is a topic that we could literally spend hours going through examples of bad customer service and we won't sure. connect the audience to that. But I know at, at Milestone, you guys have, have thought about this a lot. You said you're a platform and an agency. But you came up with an acronym that I thought was really interesting, and I'd love to go through that with the audience today. This acronym that you came up with was TEAM. First of all, yeah. if you could just sort of give us a high level of what that means in your mind, and then let's sort of go through it step by step. Yeah. So uh, in, in order to you know not give homework to the audience, uh, let's you know let's put this in four buckets: TEAM, track, engage, appreciate, and mobilize. Mm, so okay. we're going to talk about 15, 20 ideas in the next 20 minutes. And uh, they all fall into track, engage, appreciate, and mobilize. So tracking, um, you know, like uh, Peter Drucker, everybody, you can't if you you know you can't fix what you can't track. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna grow if you're not if you're not paying attention to it. So what's in your dashboard? You know, what what's in your dashboard about your customer? Um, whether you're a small company or a big company, if you are a subscription business, most of your revenue, eighty percent probably, is coming from recurring business. So shouldn't that be where the report starts? But it often starts with sales. Who are we competing against? Who, where can we win another contract? Where can we win more business? The dashboard itself tells you something about your orientation. And the first step to solving this problem or first step to getting more customer obsessed is figure out what, what data you're even paying attention to. That's the first. So the order of revenue I just mentioned is uh, usually about 80% uh, recurring, 20% new. There's a, a chunk that's uh, that is upsell, which is also a really important metric. It's amazing, like how many organizations don't even have a dashboard. They're not really tracking. It's it's some simple spreadsheets, or it's a lot of gut feel. These are our best customers. This is the kind of thing that people like to buy. This is yeah. when they like to buy it. But they really don't have any empirical data behind it. No, no. So so look at what you're tracking. If you're not tracking anything, I've got some ideas for you. One popular over the, it's a, getting a little bit dated now, but NPS, net promoter score. Sure. So a net promoter score means how many people are not indifferent about your business? What percent of the people that fill out that survey would say, I like this podcast. I'd recommend this podcast. This is, this is good stuff. And you get a score of between 20 and 50 typically for, for most B2B businesses. The problem with NPS is that it is a lagging indicator. It is an indicator of how happy your customer was last week or last month, but it doesn't tell you like how, the, how you're doing right now. And it's sort of a cumulative, somewhat backward looking. Yes. Another indicator of how you're doing, uh, and it's a pretty easy number, and it's one that people are interested in is upsell. Are your customers buying more stuff from you? If you're a store, are they coming back to your store? If you're a service provider, are they extending their contracts? If you're a platform, are they extending their capacity of license? You know, Salesforce is fantastic at upsell. They buy all these companies and they add on small companies and small features, and then they come around and tell you about them. But you gotta like what you're getting from Salesforce to buy more to buy more of that. So upsell is really important. I think it's underemphasized. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I've recently been more active on accounts, uh, and I've been like executive sponsoring accounts. I see upsell opportunities every other meeting and mm. I, I want from accounts that I work on. I want to see them every week. And if we don't have a lot to talk about, we'll get off the call in five or 10 minutes. So upsell is huge. Renewal is obviously renewal, attrition, churn. This is what so many tech companies in the Valley are. You know, that's where so many of these big valuations come from on the SaaS companies. But what's the renewal rate? Are you renewing and you know, are you expanding the accounts? And the, the calculation itself is a little bit, you know, there, there, a lot of thought needs to go into what you're going to measure. But let's say a simple one is if I had 100 customers last year at the, in December, the following December, how many of those original 100 uh, are still with me? How many of them renewed? So do I have 93? I've got 7% account churn. Then there's revenue churn and product usage churn and so on. But that's, that's tracking. That's the T in Teams. 
I think that's so interesting too, because especially when you're talking about renewals and all these subscription-based businesses, it's so common for them to have a first year promotion. You know, the cost is about half of what it normally is on the renewal. Yeah. And then those renewals come along and all of a sudden you see mass cancellations because maybe people enjoyed the product at half price, but they're not going to see the value at full price. And you've, you've got to watch that. Yeah, it's always the problem with discounting. I mean, you'd always rather add value and communicate value and build relationship. I and mean, that's part of being customer obsessed is they like you too much to fire you, right? Part of like you, you, you bring them on podcasts, you, you cover them in your blog, they speak in your events, you go out to dinner with them, all these things uh, I'll talk about uh, in Mobilize. But next, next in the acronym is E for engage. Meet regularly. I, I never can understand any ongoing relationships that don't have recurring meetings. You know, Outlook makes that really easy for us. I don't think a, a once a month meeting is going to do it. You know, yep. you that problem is going to be stale and they're going to be frustrated and you're, you're kind of bleeding goodwill if it's three weeks uh, of non of non addressing their problem. I like to see customers every week. Um, like I said, if you don't have something to talk about, you can sign off early. Um, I email my customers a couple times a week between meetings. And what I'm doing there is I'm re when I'm reading, I'm researching, I'm looking at what's on Forrester, I'm reading blogs. When I find something that's relevant to one of those customers, one of those milestone customers, I just send it over. Is, is this helpful? And I ask for that feedback and are, you know, am I filling up your, your um, uh, inbox too much? Um, but you're not asking them for something, you're providing some value. Yeah. And yeah, I want them. I want not. And it's even more than that, Eric. I want them to know that I'm thinking about them. Yeah. I think about, I don't have a lot of customers. I'm executive sponsor on a couple of accounts, three accounts right now. And I think about them every day. And one of them calls me almost every day to make that <laughs> inbound to me when they need help. But, um, you know, others, I just want them to know I'm thinking about their business. The next time I get on the call, it's sort of like naturally, how can we make, how, what, what else can we do for you? And yep. it, it expands the relationship. So, to me, it's about caring. It's about empathy that I think about you and I think about your business. Uh, she told me she was going to Las Vegas and um, I, I saw on TV some of the new things that were in Vegas. So I researched them for her, put together an email and said, hey, here's some new stuff in Vegas. Nobody's been to Vegas in 18 months because it was COVID. But and I you know, sent them over to her. I'm like, you might want to check these out. It, she just it's a personal touch. Be cared about. It's personal. Yeah. You know, that can go a long way to improving the retention. It, you know, it can't you can't cover for a product that's not working, but you can cover some of the edges. How about texting? Can you text or team chat or Slack your customers? How many of your customers are in your speed dial? And if you text them, will they text you back? Yeah. That's that's a totally different relationship. If somebody's managing a big book of 30 or 40, this engagement at a text level, text is obviously more it's obviously more intimate than email, right? Email is this kind of industrial place where I'm doing a lot of my desktop workflow, but my email is on my person. Uh, my text is on my personal phone. Um, I, I love that. You know, just to that point, it's interesting because I work with clients, I work with vendors all the time. And every once in a while, you know, I haven't heard from a vendor in a while. So I want to reach out to them, just, you know, ping them. So maybe I'll ask them a question. And yeah. it's interesting, even though some of them have been excellent to work with, they don't respond because it's not a request for business, right? It's, it's a question and it's like, you can't do that. You know, you have to sort of keep those lines of communication. You want to build that relationship. So when business does come along, there's an easy opening to sort of present that business. Yeah. You're top of mind, but you're not only are you top of mind, you're top of heart. You're, yes. you're like, you're so familiar and you're, you're, you're entering into the friend zone. It's sort of my style. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my ancestors are from the Mediterranean. I, I have a real warm engagement style. And I think that that serves well. And customers like, everybody likes attention. It's validating. Yes. So if, and when you're communicating like that, you can find problems so early, right? The, the earlier you find the problem, the smaller it is, the less, you know, the less loss of goodwill that's happened uh, when they're, because they haven't been frustrated for a long time with it. Yeah. Here's another idea about engagement. Do an interview just like this, Eric. Mm. You know, like I'm not saying to do a podcast, but to do a qualitative interview. NPS scores are are a little bit weird. They're a little bit unnatural. Uh, they don't tend. They tend to go to the platform user, not to the executive. Yes. But you know, you can you can do a quarterly business review 
but what about just, Hey, like I, could I, you know, could I schedule 15 minutes of time? I want to hear how it's going. I want to hear what your perspectives are. I want to hear challenges. You know, what can we do better that, that, what can I do better? It's so humble that it's, there's nothing like that in the NPS. NPS is this, you know, dry cut number, but interview, are you interviewing your executives, you know, your executive customers? That's, it's easy to do. It's qualitative research, right? And if you think about how we do marketing on the outbound side, uh, we, we love quantitative research. We see things in bulk in the thousands, but you know, if you do three or four qualitative interviews, you're going to get a, a different and better read, a different read certainly than the, the quantitative. So well, that's one of the, the things I really like about that is that we are bombarded by surveys. And I think for a lot of people, surveys have become an annoyance rather than yeah. a real opportunity to provide feedback because businesses have dropped the ball, quite frankly, and they survey their customers too much and people get the impression that nothing is going to happen as the result of this survey. You're simply trying to make some customer service agent feel better, you know, because yeah. their performance report will be better because it's they homework, scored. right, Eric? Yeah, it's you're, homework. Like, you're, you're making me do homework. I don't know what I get out of that. I, you yeah. know, I mean, I know I, I'm as a marketer, I need, say, I that's need NPS. Yeah, right. right. No, you do need it. But I mean, if I if I scored somebody low on NPS. And then I got a call the next day saying, hey, we're really concerned. You know, the score, can we talk about this in more detail? That would be meaningful to me. If I score somebody low and I never hear anything from the company, you just wonder what the point was. Uh, yeah, uh, I've, I've definitely been in companies where those the, the bad scores escalate really quickly because it was a subscription business. And you do have executives following up, which is which is also on the verge of self-serving. Right. They're following mm. up because I'm mad. They're right. not following up because they care. They're not yeah. following up because they want to help. Right. They're just following up because they think they're going to get fired. What's well, that lagging indicator, as you discussed, right? Lagging, it's, it's yeah. Lagging. I'm already now, and is it better now, or do you, like it's even more transactional at that point? It's better than nothing, but it's it's not it's not texting you before every anything went bad and just making sure things are going good. Right. So that's T and E track and engage. Now next is appreciate, and we've already started to touch on this, but give the gift of time. Everybody's busy. Everybody values their own time. What do you, you know, are you, how, are you reaching out? Are you calling? Are you communicating? And, you know, I miss going out to dinner. I miss I, a customer and client entertainment is so important. It's so part of my job to spend money. And my stick at my last job was that I'm, I'm kind of a wine enthusiast. So I would connect with people about wine and I ask, what kind of wine do you like? And if they ever did me a favor or wrote me a review, I'd send them a half case of the wine, you know, I'd, I like not, I mean, it, it's a decent gift if they drink and, but it's connected to them and they know I, I, I asked and I listened, that's, you know, that's showing my appreciation. But the other thing that needs to happen when you are giving the gift of time is to be present. That is, Absolutely. If you are going to be in front of customers and you're the kind of exec that's doing some seagull exec, uh, you know, exec uh, support on an account and you're sort of checked out during and they see it. Yeah, that, that's terrible. If, you know, like, God forbid your, your phone buzzes or something and you get distracted, people notice they feel they feel unimportant if you if you divert your attention from them. I had um, I had a, actually was a CEO at a prior company and. He was the busiest guy I knew, hardest working guy I knew. I never, I went out to lunch with him a number of times as a customer and as then later as a friend in contact, never, ever saw him look at his phone during, um, during uh, time with me, he was never, saw, never saw him do it. Now, when I, I did go to work for him and I, he did that all the time, he would look at his phone during the meetings and you kind of realize, okay, I'm, I'm a bit lost him a bit here, but he would never do it with customers. He was really good at being present. That's a great skill, but yeah. it's not just the mechanism of trying to be appreciative, but like being there for them. Um, another thing that kind of surprises me is like if people, if you ask a customer for a reference, do you send a reference? Do you send a gift? Oh, yeah. I, a reference is so valuable. You're working on a $50,000 contract and they're putting their name and their brand and their logo against your relationship. And it's a big deal. Uh, and, you know, people who are being transactional, people who aren't being appreciative, sometimes busy salespeople. Oh, was I supposed to send a gift? I'm like, uh-huh. 
I, what do you usually send? I, I usually a bottle of wine or a bottle of booze. You figure out what they like. Sometimes an Amazon gift card, but she's like, uh, I don't know how to do that. This prior company. And I'm like, I'll take care of it for you. Just give me the email address. I got it. And then, you know, I'll, I'll come in and, and send it. Um, those are a couple, those are a couple, any thoughts or comments? No, that, that's great. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking is that, you know, we live in this magnificent online world right now. If you want to send somebody a letter, you can go to a site like postable.com and they will send a card on your behalf, you know, in something that looks like handwriting. You don't have to go to the post office, buy a stamp, stick it in the mail. Mm -hmm. There are ways to do this that you don't even have to leave your desk. So many easy ways to buy a simple gift, a gift card, yeah. just a way to show that appreciation. And it's amazing how many people don't do that. Yeah, I, the not doing it and then the value. Think about if somebody's helping you close a sale, it's an it's an hour of executive time, effectively, right? Like your time, mm -hmm. my time, who's ever, and they're they're gonna go get on a call for fifteen or twenty minutes, but they're gonna prep too, right? Like people don't like yep. to just tumble into a call. So an hour of exec time is a couple hundred bucks. You know, if you're consulting or contracting or whatever, make the gift make make sure you recognize the value of their time before you know you ask again. Otherwise, it might not work out as well. Here's a couple of more advanced ones on appreciate, um, make introductions. So if you download your LinkedIn network and, or, you know, just so you can see it all in a, you know, in a flat file, I've got like 2,600, it's a lot to look at and you can sort it a little bit. Who on this list would benefit from knowing somebody else on this list? Who, who, who would be friends? Who, who works in the same city? You know, maybe we know people, you know, I know people in Denver, Maybe they're about the same age, doing the same kind of stuff. Why wouldn't I introduce them? Now you're you're enriching their life. You're a, you're showing your appreciation for what they do for you, and you're being a good friend. That's um, I started doing uh, I started doing small like roundtables and and office hours kind of things because the Zoom fatigue is getting you know like webinars getting a little bit tired with this much Zoom. So you know letting people interact, and then I could see there's three people in the healthcare industry. I'm like, hey, you guys are in the healthcare industry. You know, I, I can see your e email addresses. Let me send this to the three of you. Maybe you guys want to connect. That's that's going the extra mile. That's being customer obsessed. And these weren't even customers. These are just prospects. I'm not just prospects, but valuable prospects. No, I love that idea because it doesn't always have to be something tangible. It can be that introduction, which could be extremely valuable. But again, it's a great way to show that you're thinking about your customers, that you understand their interests, and you understand why somebody else might be valuable for them to meet. Yeah, intellectually, that's right. But it just, it shows that you care. Like, yeah. I mean, and it's so differentiated. I mean, like, you know, handwritten notes is good. But, uh, you know, this is like a, a handwritten idea of yeah. who I, I could give you a new friend. And I've heard so many times that mathematically, the, the connections of your connections are the most uh, high potential part of your network. Sure. So you personally know about four or 500 people but they each know four or 500 people. And it's in that second network that you have a lot of reach out into the social graph. So that's one. Another one is giving leads. Do you, do you, um, do you buy things from your customers? Do you like, well, we're going to switch, I'm going to switch vendors so that we're giving business where we get business. That's part of it. And do you help them build their business? Do you think about somebody else you might know that could use their services? Do you just make introductions? Hey, I thought these guys, you know, might like to, you know, need your consulting or your product or, you know, your service. So those are some of the, I love that. Yeah. Appreciate. So we're at, we're at, you know, team, we're at the A and now we're going to the M and that's mobilize. And I got a couple more M's in this mnemonic. Uh, <laughs> meet Perfect. deadlines. Okay. You can't miss deadlines. Like the customers asking for your commitment and they're judging whether you, whether you hit it. So you have to meet all deadlines, a document, an email, a response, and be clear about whether you're talking about is does Thursday end tonight at midnight or does Thursday end tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern? You're East Coast. I'm West Coast. It's two o'clock my time. You know, meet that deadline. Meet SLA. So um, SLA is service level agreement. You know, your contract often says I will do these things within this amount of time or I'm, I'm effectively in breach of contract. You have to meet the SLAs. You you have to do that. You've got to be conscious of them. Your team has to read their documents. You guys have to refresh yourself. This is what we said we would do. And this is how we be a good teammate here with, with our customer. We meet our SLAs. Make it right. This one's pretty obvious. When customers are mad and they escalate, something's got to get fixed. 
Yeah. Or and I guess the other M here would be make good. You know, if if you if it's if it's something's broken, you give them something. You give them something extra. You give flexibility. You give more product, more service. But you have to make it right for people. You have to mobilize your company. And some of the great stories of the customer, the original customer obsessed Nordstrom, Southwest Airlines, people being able to fix things for, you know, uh, people at the great hotels that are able to just, they've got some budget to take care of stuff. Oh, you need batteries? I'll send somebody to the store to get them for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you need you need a new pair of socks? Oh, you're, you know, something like that. Those giving those people the, the ability to, to make things right is, um, you know, uh, that was the original, the Nordstrom model. Those are a couple there. No, Lots I think that that's really interesting because I'm a huge believer in empowering employees to make things right. Yeah. I also am a believer in that the customer is not always right. There can be some difficult customers that are never satisfied and you can turn your organization sort of inside out trying to make them happy and they will never be happy. And I think there does need to be a point where you look at a customer and say, is this, you know, good time going for something? This is that a good marriage. Yeah, is this a good marriage? That's exactly right. If not, um, maybe, maybe, maybe we don't we don't do it next year. And the, you know, these right. are few and far between. But I think the yeah. bigger issue there is the empowerment. And too often in an organization, people are just not empowered to make something right when you look at it and say, why not? You know, yeah. what what is the hindrance to uh, giving them the autonomy to make this right? Yeah. Um sort of a power and control model, you know, yeah, right, exactly. centralized, decentralized thinking. Um, you know, the customer's not always right, but they're usually right mm -hmm. because they're the customer. They, they had an expectation and it's most of the responsibility is on us to align to that expectation and to, you know, to, to keep it right for them. Or we set the expectations incorrectly. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, usually leads to problems. And those are, those are some of the things you got to iron out in onboarding. And the first couple of times there's escalations, you sure. usually, they'll give you a couple of mulligans, you know, customers yeah. will they'll give you some space to work out these things and look at the contract and, you know, have a, have a few meetings, but after a while, you got to, you got to do all these things to get customer obsession, right? So that's reaction. Um, what about pre-action? You know, think about minority report. If you know the movie, a great sure. concept of, of, pre-crime. Well, what about pre-acting? Just eliminate problems, eliminate friction that would be frustrating if you were the customer, that would be frustrating if you have a picky customer or whatever, whatever type you have. Pre-act to reduce these things so that you're mobilizing your organization so that there's less tickets being open, less support tickets coming in. Ask for feedback. And then if all these things are going right and you've done the team, ask for reviews. And this is a really humbling experience. The way I do this with uh, at Milestone and at prior companies, I said, just, can you do me a favor? You know, could you write a review about the product on G2 Crowd or on Trust Radius or Clutch? You know, there's a, those, the search engine, um, Google has reoriented the search results to be biased towards objective re review sites over brands. Google prefers those sites because they are answering the question, which is the best of this or that? Yes. So you need you need to manage your reputation, but there's no way to game it. You know, they check the LinkedIn of the people filling it out. They often check, make you prove that you're a product user, you know, send them a screenshot and so forth. So all of these things have to be right. And with hum humility, you ask for a favor and uh, you get a review and it's it's on the Internet for 10 or 20 years. It lasts almost forever. It's huge value. So that is the team acronym. That's that's the structure of customer obsession. I've got a couple of more stories and anecdotes, but uh, no, I love that because I, you want something that's easy to understand, and I think it's a mindset shift. You know, you have to move away from sort of internal focus, product focus, and start yeah. to think more about putting yourself in the shoes of your customer. And you know, we all interact with businesses every day, and we know what makes us happy. We know yeah. what makes us fulfilled, and it's amazing how often that doesn't translate into our work life. It is amazing. You know, we get, like you said, we just get the priorities kind of wrong. We prioritize internal stuff over external stuff. That's, that's not obsessed. That's being, that's being bureaucratic, right? That's the nature of bureaucracy that feels impersonal and, and doesn't make us happy. So the, the, this acronym is pretty uh, easy to remember, but you want to be part of their team. I think we've all been in service positions or we've been on brand side or, or service side. 
when people say, oh, we see you as part of our team, you know, we count you as a team. I've, I've been, you know, you get invited sometimes to the, the employee holiday parties, stuff like that. You really feel like an extended part of the team. That's the goal is for that mm -hmm. to be true and real and authentic that uh, they, they see you as part of the team, but you got to work at it. You got to, you know, we've just reviewed about 16 uh, yeah. tactics that you can use to get there. Now, another topic that other another construct that's really useful is the trusted advisor, which is it's getting it's a little bit dated now. But I um, in marketing, I often train salespeople after they do product training. So they come out of product training and they talk product. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really what the customer wants to hear. They want to they want to hear solutions. And I said, if you're selling pots and pans, you're going door to door, or let's say Cutco knives, really good product, love the, love the product, but somebody comes by and they're like, buy a knife. You can have this knife or this knife or this knife. Like it's, you know, they, they, haven't, they haven't figured out if I'm, if I'm gonna be cutting a lot of meat or if I'm a fisherman or if, uh, you know, I, I need a tool for the backyard or whatever it is, they don't really know me yet. But if you're a trusted advisor, it's really about the discussion, like this kind of a discussion where you and I are you and I are exchanging ideas that help me know you and you, and you know me. I gave I gave the example of uh, I I had a tax problem a couple of years ago, a complicated tax problem, and I called up some attorneys, you know, and one of them just started consulting with me. She says, "I'll I'll give you some advice right now. I'll tell I've, I've dealt with this before, and this is this is how I would go at it." She gave me about. 20 or 30 minutes of lawyering. And I thought, well, I feel better. I feel like, I feel like this is going to, and she won the business and she did a great job and everything worked out good. That's trusted advisor. If she had said, I have a package for this kind of real estate tax issue. I, uh, my, my fixed package, my product A, B, and C is 3000, 5,000. And I need a retainer. She's like, you know, it's a couple hundred bucks an hour. It's reasonable. And she, you know, she knew the people I was dealing, going to deal with. That was great. And the, 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 the feeling of talking to a trusted advisor, and when you think about it in terms of accounting or legal problems that are big, not like just knives, pots and pans, then you get how you want to be when you're selling software. Even if your widget's only a couple thousand bucks, it's better if like, you know, you, you communicate that value to them in and and make them kind of believe in you and your product and that you understand it goes back to this the whole all the things we were talking about in in customer obsession this works a lot on in the sales cycle with prospects well and i think especially if you're in a service industry adding that value before you sort of aggressively go for the sale can make such a difference in building up that trust. And I've dealt with far too many service professionals that they immediately want, you know, to sign you up for, like you said, a package or some sort of a service. Yeah. It's like, Hey, I've just got this simple question. Let's build a little trust yeah. here. And yeah. maybe there's a lot more business that could come your way, but yeah. I, I'd like to take a, you know, dip my toe in the water first sure. before I go there. And some are very reluctant to do it. Yeah. That's product led growth. That's the freemium in service, right? That, yep. Um, they're, they're getting, you know, they're giving you a taste and you're seeing if it works. And if, if you guys like working together, I had a plumber come out the, and I thought I had figured out what the problem was. And so I was like, they came out and then they looked at it. I showed them some pictures and he said, uh, and then he said, it's a, uh, you know, it's like $6,000 to replace that pipe. I'm like, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll figure something else out. He goes, and here's a bill for $179 for coming out for the estimate. Yes. yes. Okay. You know what I did? I went back to my office. I, I paid it because I didn't, I hadn't asked that they wouldn't do that. I went on Yelp and I told everybody this company charges $179 to come out. Be careful. Yes. That's going to be on the internet forever. Yes. Yeah. The, the if power they had told of me that, if they told me, I might've said, I, you know, okay, I, I don't, it's, I'm not sure I want to invest that yet on the estimate. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it was just, it's $179, right? But that negative review, like you said, will last kind of forever. Yes. And was it really worth $179 uh, for that guy to do that? I, I think sometimes the trade-off that people are making is very poor. I had a recent example myself of, of an accountant who did a terrible job for me. And I kept saying, you know, you're a review-based business. This isn't good. You know, let's end this relationship on a positive note. Yeah. And, they you couldn't even threaten him, him or her into doing the right thing, right? And they couldn't, and they wouldn't do it. They were, they were so stubborn just to be right. 
And uh, yeah, so it cost him a bad review, which is unfortunate. You know, Eric, I think we could talk about this stuff for hours. This is really good. I'm going to make sure that uh, at the end of this, we're going to write a blog. So we're going to list all this stuff in the blog. But I would love it if you could just share with people where they can find out more about you, where they can find out more about uh, Milestone. Uh, where's your spot on the net? Yeah, I, I LinkedIn's a good place to start. So uh, LinkedIn slash Eric Newton. Uh, I work for Milestone Internet and a lot of resources and uh, white papers I put together are up in milestoneinternet.com slash resources. You can have a look there. You can reach me for anything I might be able to help you with at eric.n at milestoneinternet.com. And uh, if you come from if you come in on LinkedIn, please mention the podcast and Eric and, uh, you know, we'll be sure to connect there. Hey, that's great. You know, this is fascinating. Like I said, it's one of my favorite topics to talk about. Uh, there are a lot of bad examples out there, but boy, when you see some good ones, it just, you know, makes you smile, right? Because you can have a lot of success if you really change your mindset, you become customer obsessed, you look at your processes and say, how can we do this better with the customer in mind? It can create some pretty big dividends for your organization. Absolutely. Yeah, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you, Eric.